Welcome to Sacred Treks, a series where we look at the Star Trek franchise through unconventional themes in order to see what life lessons we can learn from the series. And today, we're going to be looking at Galileo 7, one of the most memorable episodes of the original series' first season. Galileo 7 was one of the first episodes to focus solely on the character of Spock, who was still somewhat being formed as a character at the time by the writers of the show, and actually showed exactly what made him so alien and different to the rest of the crew. Yet it was also the episode that actually made Spock more relatable and, seemingly paradoxically, actually more human to most of the viewers watching the show, if not his fellow crew members. But how was that possible? Well, I think we can answer that by looking at this episode, and Spock's portrayal in it specifically, through the theme of autism and neurodivergency. So let's jump in, because this is Sacred Treks. Space. The final frontier. 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 It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. A <laughs> human being A single act of compassion can put you in touch with your own humanity. Loss of life is to be mourned, but only if the life was wasted. My child was not. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us. You know, your father was captain of a starship for 12 minutes. He saved 800 lives. I dare you to do better. You are a Starfleet captain. You believe in service, sacrifice, compassion, and love. The past is written. But the future is left for us to write, and we have powerful tools, reels, openness, optimism, and the spirit of curiosity. The needs of the many outweigh the means of the few, or the one. Now before we get into the theme of this episode, let's do what we usually do and recap the episode in my typical sarcastic way. So as to remind us that while we are taking Star Trek as sacred and can certainly learn things from it, it by no means should be taken as a perfect work or a work of God. Dear, dear God, not at all. Gods in Star Trek? Not, not a good thing. The Enterprise is en route to deliver medicine to Macus III in five days, a handoff overseen by Galactic High Commissioner Ferris, aka bureaucratic asshole number 167 on this show. However, the Enterprise is sidelined by a quasar, a priceless scientific opportunity which Kirk describes as vague, undefined. Kind of like how you would describe the Enterprise's need to stop to look at a pulsar when people need actual medicine. But who cares? It takes three whole days to get to Macus 3, so there's two whole days to study a science-y thing. Because you know what Spock says. I like science. And fuck sick people. I think that, that part was implied. McCoy, Scotty, Spock, and some random crew members who probably most of them won't die, and one softly focused shot crew woman head out on the shuttle Galileo 7. Oh, funny, that's the name of the episode. I wonder if that's gonna mean anything. But due to some sciencey yancey stuff, are forced to crash land and are without the Enterprise knowing where they are. Spock quickly orders the crew about in a fairly logical, yet somewhat dismissive way, which gets everyone, including McCoy, all huffy. Except for Scotty, he's a good old boy who just listens to the orders. Meanwhile, back on the Enterprise, Kirk and Ferris are casually sipping coffee as they search for the crew. You know what, basically I'll just sum up the entirety of the Enterprise part of this plotline for you really quickly. I want to search for my crew. No, we gotta get medicine to the sick people. But my crew, it's seven whole people. Ugh, fine, I'll wait two days while literally people are dying, but fine, but not a second longer. Yay! Crew, send out some search parties where more red shirts will die than people we're trying to save. Lance and O'Neill got a spear through the body before we even knew they were around. We're saving lives here, folks. While the crash shuttle crew scout out the planet, a crew member gets hit with the best cartoonishly large spear ever. And another crew member goes after him and... I'm sorry, what was that effect that I just saw? 1960s effects. Gotta love them. Also, some Star Trek fans say modern Star Trek is too gruesome, and Star Trek the original series says, Hold my bloody spear. Jesus, that's gnarly. 
The Maroon crewmen get upset at Spock for not caring enough about their dead friend, but Spock is trying to think how to logically save the crew. Eventually, he orders his crewmates to attack and scare the creatures that were attacking them, but not kill them, which really pisses off the fairly bloodthirsty crew. I'm frequently appalled by the low regard you Earthmen have for life. Well, we're practical about it. I love how we're really thinking about the Prime Directive here, people. In the fighting, Crumentano gets lost, so Spock risks his life to go save him, and runs away from the worst spear throws of all time. Back at the ship, everyone is pissed off at Spock for letting the crewmen die, and not understanding that the creatures would retaliate in anger instead of fear. McCoy starts to get speciesist against Spock, while the creatures bang styrofoam rocks against the ship. Scotty shocks the ship as the crew defends the shuttle, but Spock himself gets stuck under a styrofoam rock and tells everyone to lift off, but the crew decides to save him. Up in space, Spock decides to send a desperate message in emotion response, and really the only thing he could do at that moment. And the Enterprise picks up the beacon right at the last minute, saving everybody except those red shirts on the rescue mission and all the people that died in the two days Enterprise didn't get them their medicine. But back on the ship, Kirk publicly embarrasses Spock, who doesn't like to talk about his emotions, and the entire crew awkwardly laughs for a really, really long time as the credits roll. <laughs> Several of our crew members are dead, and others still have lost their confidence on our first officer. How hilarious! What a, what a wonderful time this has been! Alright, on to the theme of autism and neurodivergency in this episode. Recently, I did a video about autistic representation in Star Trek as a whole, and in that video, I briefly touched upon this episode, Galileo 7. But I wanted to take this opportunity in Sacred Treks to do a deeper dive into how this episode truly shines when we look at Spock at it through a neurodivergent lens. Soon after the Galileo 7 crashes, Spock immediately goes into leadership mode, ordering his crew to do exactly what they need to do in order to most efficiently deal with their present situation. Spock stops at each crew member and tells them specifically what to do, sorting them into teams and giving them goals. Mr. Scott, if you'll make a survey of uh, damage, please. Logical. Gentlemen, I think we should move outside and make room for Mr. Scott to do his work. Mr. Latimer, Mr. Gatano, you'll arm yourselves. Scott out the area, keeping in visual contact with the ship. Aye, aye, sir. He basically also talks his thinking out loud as he does everything, even checking if the communication equipment on the shuttle can reach the Enterprise, despite knowing that that probably wouldn't work. Expect nothing, Mr. Scott. It is merely logical to try all the alternatives. This type of logical and detail-oriented attention and leadership is common for many neurodivergent people. For example, many neurodivergent people, such as myself, create detailed systems in which to handle their plans of actions. I make lists, for example. Pretty much my entire day is built around crossing things off a list that I make at the start of each day, as I plan each and every segment of my routine in order to most efficiently get things done. Spock's quickly categorical mind is easily translatable into an autistic context in that mode. Yet, as we see with Spock, this reliance on logic can quickly be read as distanced, unempathetic, or uncaring. After Spock notes that a crew member may have to stay behind on the planet to rescue everyone else, and that he will decide who has to stay logically rather than fairly, McCoy remarks that Spock needs to work on his heart. If any minor damage was overlooked, it was when they put his head together. Not his head, Mr. Bowman. His heart. His heart. Many neurodivergent people are often read as inhuman, as if they don't actually care about the people around them, only the results. Additionally, neurodivergent folks often don't have a filter, not understanding that sometimes the things they say can hurt others. As Spock's line about how he would decide who would die logically did for the crew. To use a real life example, I was once in a situation in middle school where I knew a friend of mine had recently had a dog die, a dog that they loved and deeply cherished. But one day, that same friend a few days later, after getting a math question wrong, said jokingly in class, Ugh, this is the worst day of my life. And me, without thinking about it, said, How can this be your worst day? Didn't your dog just die? Yeah, I actually said that. Obviously, a horrible thing to say, and she immediately started crying. And I felt awful. But I didn't say that out of malice or anger or an attempt to be cruel. I just said it because I thought she literally meant that it was the worst day of her life, and I was confused because I knew she had experienced worse days before this. This is because, as an autistic person, I didn't really understand the social dynamics of play or the idea of hyperbole. I just took her words literally and became confused because I just was logically thinking about what her words meant and the implications they had about her life. And then again, because I don't have social skills, I just blurted out the first thought that came to my mind. Now, as an adult, I have a slightly better understanding of the social dynamics at play in that situation, but it goes to show the extra effort that neurodivergent folks often have to take in order to understand hyperbole or what people really mean, and can often say things that come across as cold or uncaring as a result. It's also worth noting that McCoy says Spock needs a heart behind Spock's back, not to his face. 
While McCoy of all people is certainly willing to push back to Spock to his face, many neurodivergent people don't have this luxury of someone willing to speak to them in an effort to be constructive rather than deconstructive. Instead, often neurodivergent folks can be called robots or inhuman behind their back, especially when they're young. I myself was bullied for seeming to act different around my peers when I was in high school and middle school and elementary school and preschool. Got it the whole line there. This type of feeling can even get further exacerbated as the episode shows us. As the situation on the planet continues to get worse and worse for the poor stranded crew, the crew members begin to resent Spock and even question his leadership, despite the fact that he is their superior officer. When they're attacked by the most ridiculous spears of all time, instead of trusting Spock's instincts, the crew continually pushes back against Spock, questioning his decisions and thus causing him to question himself. I say we hit them dead on. Yes, I know, but fortunately I'm giving the orders. Again, this is common for neurodivergent people, especially when dealing with others. While certainly autistic folks are able to think their way through a situation, they often don't know how to interact with other people or read people, as many of us lack the ability to instantly recognize social cues. Basically, neurodivergent folks lack the ability to intuit what other people's emotions and wants are. And this can cause us extreme anxiety in social situations, as we worry about others because we simply can't look at someone and understand their feelings just instinctively. This can cause us to question ourselves in the middle of a social situation, which again exacerbates our anxiety, creating a perpetual loop that feeds in on itself. Spock's lack of ability to intuit emotions also leads him to make mistakes in his logical thinking. He logically deduces that fighting back against the creatures will get them to stop attacking them, as the logical response for them would be to back off from a technologically superior foe. But Spock doesn't recognize that the creatures would get angry or territorial, which are emotional responses to his provocations. Did it ever occur to you they might react emotionally? With anger? Doctor, I'm not responsible for their unpredictability. They were perfectly predictable to anyone with feeling. His lack of emotional understanding leads to his leadership failures. So again, we start to see this loop happen. As the situation gets more dire, the surviving crew gets angry at Spock, even directly calling him out. I'm sick and tired of your logic. We could use a little inspiration. Strange. Step by step, I've made the correct and logical decisions. And yet two men have died. This leads Spock to become frozen, questioning his instincts while simultaneously spiraling the crew out of trust with him at the worst possible moments. Again, the cycle gets worse and worse and worse. But much of the crew's distrust of Spock comes from their belief that he completely lacks any emotional empathy for any of them, that he wouldn't think about their lives, but only the logical needs of a situation above all. But the episode gives us clear hints about how untrue that idea really is. In fact, Spock's empathy and understanding extends even further than his crew. At one point in the episode, Spock remarks that he wishes to try to limit the loss of life to not only his crew, but of the beasts attacking them. To take life indiscriminately. The majority. I'm not interested in the opinion of the majority, Mr. Catano. The components must be weighed. Our dangers to ourselves, as well as our duties to other life forms. Friendly or not. He questions his crewmate's desire to become murderous, and in many ways he makes the right call. Killing the aliens would not only have made them angrier, but also, more importantly, it was the moral Starfleet thing to do, to think of the lives of others even at the expense of your own. But this thinking isn't just on the macro scale of between group fighting. Twice in the episode, Spock risks his life to save crew members, once when he goes to save Lieutenant Tano, and again when he tells his crew to leave him behind after he gets trapped by a rock. It is not that Spock is completely uncaring or without emotion, just that it is not something he is clearly able to show nor is he able to understand others' emotions. And the same goes for many people on the autistic spectrum. We are not cold, callous monsters incapable of caring. In fact, the opposite is often true. We have to spend so much extra energy and time working to try to figure out what others' emotions are, so much so that we often become hypersensitive to the feelings of others around us, because we worry that we will hurt them or say something cruel by accident because we don't understand. That story I told you about my friend's dog still hurts me to this day. I still think about it and cringe and, and feel bad about it. And that was, well, over a decade at this point. That's a, that's a thought. And that moment is still something I think about when I'm in social situations, worried that I'm going to say something wrong, that I'm going to hurt somebody just without thinking, which is why I put extra effort into thinking about my words. I also like to think that I'm a truly kind and caring being who tries to take extra time to think about others' feelings, even if it's the feelings of those who hurt me. I've tried to do that in videos that I've done on J.K. Rowling, for example, who I believe has hurt the transgender community, but I still try to empathize with her position. Spock does much the same, even if he appears cold and distant. In the end, Spock does get his crew off the planet and saves most of their lives. So in some ways, he was successful. But I do think it's worth noting that, in many ways, Spock's moment at leadership in this episode was 
predominantly a failure. He failed because he relied on logic alone, unable to handle his crew's emotional needs, an important part of leadership. But I do love that this episode was just the beginning of Spock's journey, not the end of his journey as a leader. As we see throughout the franchise, Spock eventually becomes one of the best, most empathetic and caring leaders in all of Starfleet. His empathy grows so big that he even gives up his life to try to reconcile Romulans and Vulcans in Star Trek The Next Generation, two groups that had so long hurt each other. Spock in many ways becomes the most empathetic character in all of Trek, and that journey began right here in this episode, Galileo 7. Similarly, many autistic folks are on our own journeys, constantly trying to grow and learn how to be better human beings, to better understand and empathize with others around us, and to better feel comfortable showing our true selves and emotions with others. So in that way, autistic people are perhaps the true individual representations of what Star Trek is all about, showing how we can all grow and become better human beings. That's it for this episode of Sacred Treks. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below about Galileo 7 or Spock as a neurodivergent or autistic representation. He's one of my favorite characters. Obviously, he's a favorite character of many people. So let me know what you think of him and my thoughts on him in this episode. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more discussions of geek topics and more Sacred Treks and all those things. I have a lot more Sacred Treks episodes up if you want to sort of dive into this series, if this is your first episode of it. I'm excited to hear all of your thoughts on different episodes of this series or other videos on my channel. So you can get all of that by subscribing. Subscribing. And if you want to go the extra mile and help make this channel even better, please consider giving to my Patreon. It really helps me pay the bills, do cooler stuff, give more attention to this channel than it otherwise could have because I have to pay the bills other ways as well. And also you get yourself cool perks like your name and videos and things like that and some exclusive Patreon perks and videos that I only put up for my Patreon, something that I'm going to be trying to doing more going forward. Also, I do a couple podcasts like Star Trek Behind the Lines and What the Frell, so you can check those out. Links should be down in the doobly-doo. And beyond all of that, even if you don't listen to my podcast, help me on Patreon, subscribe, all that stuff, or even comment, I'm just glad that you stopped by, and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. I don't know what the heck that was. That was my, like, de-stress thing. <clears throat> Thank you to all of my patrons this month, but especially Amanda Ronye Idanya, Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Bergmoss, Ashlyn Solstice, Michael D., Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Ulysses the Pagan, Randy Thompson, Munir Amlani, Chamomile T., Stefan Schuhart, Wellington Marcus, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Wayne Twitchell, Ish the Mad, Buttoneer, Roar, Christina Dalliance, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Michael Beam. She sells seashells by the seashore of Bajor. William Stewart, Gavin Robinson, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F., Nathan Olson, Jason Knott, Andrew Jorgensen, Chris Brown, Jasmine, Maeve, Bree Beecher, Sabraxis, Skylar Gray, Nathan Steele, Jane Packard and Chloe Dollar, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Gretchen Badger, Geek Filter, Bush, Celestial Dawn, Din, Sarah Bastam, Polly Mina, Jacob Tovar, Piston Twisted Garage, Lily, Jean Methune, Andrew Lamori, Lisa, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy, Corey Honkinen, and KT Dunn. Thank you so much to all of you. You're quite literally making my dreams come true, so I, I cannot tell you how thankful I am.